Cheers, Mama. Cheers, Daddy. All right, let's jump right in here today. And I will say before we even dive in that we are not experts in uh, on this subject. Uh, basically, what we are giving to you is just some very common sense, what I feel is a very common sense approach to personal finances. And I know that there's probably many of you out there who would discourage us from doing this. But the purpose behind it is that we are we're going to take a very modest and very humble approach um, in discussing this openly with you. But we are hoping that even if there's little tiny nuggets that that some folks out there can extract from whatever it is that we cover here in the next hour or so um, about our financial journey, and they can apply that to their own personal financial goals. Great. Um, let us know down in the comments if you have any recommendations for us or for anybody else out there in the course of uh, listening to this podcast. But we wanted to dive in because we are 40 years old. And once upon a time, Melissa and I set the goal for ourselves of being debt free at 40. And uh, by the grace of God and through a lot of hard work and sacrifice, we have somehow managed to pull that off. Yeah, the, we get a lot of questions. We get a lot of questions about our finances, um, how we've managed to do what we've done out here. And there's a lot of stuff going around like, oh, they're trust fund babies or somebody gave them that land or that we are in debt up to our eyeballs with the different projects. So we just kind of wanted to clear all that up and then lay out exactly how we became 100% debt free by 40. And again, before we dive into this, I want to reiterate that this doesn't necessarily have to be your own personal goal. We're not saying that if you want to purchase property and build your own home, that this is the way to go about doing it. Everyone's journey is different. But let's say you have a smaller goal in mind of taking your family on a vacation or you want to purchase a, a boat for yourself or, or treat yourself with some kind of, uh, you know, expense that you take on um, more so, as, again, just as a reward for yeah. for uh, demonstrating a lot of financial discipline over an extended period of time. So let's let's dive into this. We're going to go about this somewhat chronologically. We actually have some notes that were jotted down because it has been a very long journey for us. Again, like I said, this is something that started 20 about years. 20 years ago when you and I were, were dating, living down in Las Vegas. Uh, we figured out that we were going to be having Nevea at a very young age and uh, that kind of opened the door to these discussions. So let's start from there, Mama. Yeah. So we found ourselves, we did not come from wealthy families. Um, nobody gave us any amount of money when we went out on our own. So mm. we found ourselves at 22 years old, unmarried, pregnant, working part time with a reasonable amount of debt, renting a one bedroom apartment. That Who did that debt belong to, though? Well, it was my student loan debt, mostly. So I went to university, got a four year degree. I became a teacher and my monthly income at the time was not covering my student loan payments, which is a very common story. And on top of that, it took me over a year to actually get a permanent teaching position. So traditionally speaking, you have always been, um, at least prior to the two of us coming together, you have, you were a spender. I was yeah. a saver. You had some debt. I had none, but that was because, um, I, I really didn't spend any money. If I was going to make a purchase of any kind, any substantial purchase, it was going to be done with cash. That's always been my mentality and philosophy. Yeah. And I didn't spend like a lot on, I didn't spend on food or coffee or going out or anything like that. Yeah. I would just buy like little things. I had an apartment and I would buy like cute dishes and things like that. But I was, a, I racked up by the time you and I got together, I had racked up $2,700 on my credit card by just making stupid purchases in college, pizza here and there. Shame, shame, shame. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I was in college and I wanted a cute pair of low rise jeans with the three inch zipper because I was going to the club, you know, stuff like that. So I had $2,700 in credit card debt. I had two student loans. One was for $10,000. The other was for around $20,000, um, which is $30,000 isn't a lot of debt when you're coming out of a four-year university, but it's a lot of money. A lot of kids today are coming out of university with $80,000, $100,000 plus. A lot of money. That's an entirely separate discussion about yeah. why it is we're pushing our kids into these uh, this tremendous, tremendous amount of debt. It's it's crazy to me. It doesn't. It's never really made sense. But in that time, we started having these discussions, and I encouraged you to be more so of a, a, a saver and maybe start paying down some of this debt that you had, especially once we figured out, like I said, that we were going to consolidate our finances. We we're going to have a child in common and uh, down the road, eventually, obviously we became married. So, yeah, I think it's really easy to be a spender when you're kind of um, aimless. When you set a goal, it's very important to set a goal and make that be a financial goal and a life goal, because then once you have something to work towards and I mean, take it seriously too, because once you have something to work for now, these little, you start thinking about, do I need that pair of jeans? Do mm -hmm. I need to go out and eat pizza? Do I, you know, it becomes different. The weight of it is different because now you have something over here that you really want. 
And that's fine. I think a lot of people would would tell you that you you should feel that way. You should you should have some fun with your money, and that's fine. But again, mm-hmm. if you do have a very specific goal in mind, like was the case for us of you know later actually determining that we wanted to be debt free by forty years old and yep. and live a life of freedom rather than living a life of feeling as though you are uh, enslaving yourself to your material possessions because you need to make a payment on whatever it is that you have going on in your life. Yeah. Americans have a lot of toys. I mean, boats and snowmobiles and timeshares and yeah, there's a sense of entitlement. Yeah. And a lot of people, cars. a lot of people aren't living within their means. And not mm-hmm. only did we, we always try to live within our means, we, we lived well, well beneath our yeah. means at any given time. We live so below our means as far as what we drove and how we dressed and the way that we went about family fun and stuff that we would have family members ask if we needed to borrow money. And that was like the that. perception. And that's, that, I think that's one of the big takeaways and things that I want to pound home and kind of emphasize here in this discussion is that you, you, you have to ignore the outside noise. And we made a, a video many years ago now, I think it was like five years ago on <laughs> yeah. uh, the good, simple living side of things about like just not spending your money and ignoring the outside influences because people have their own opinions and they, you know, people draw comparisons mm-hmm. and a lot of people have assumptions about what's going on. And that was definitely true for us to where I guess on the surface things, it appeared as though, you know, we were a single income family. We had four kids and, uh, you know, I was making a good amount of money, but, um, again, you got a family of six, it, yeah. you know, life, life is expensive. Groceries are expensive day to day, uh, expenses take their toll after a while. When in reality, what it was is that we were just trying to squirrel away as much money as we possibly could. And again, we are not financial experts. We took a very common sense approach and just made the decision to really try to limit our spending to the umpteenth degree to save every penny that we possibly could. And in the end, right. over an extended period of time, it worked out very favorably. But there's a process to it. So I mean, to go back a little bit more, well, there were mistakes that were made. So sure. I did what almost everybody does when they get that first out of university job or right out of high school job. Tradesmen do it when they get that, they land that first job or, you know, you get out of college and then you get hired as a teacher. When I got hired as a teacher, I felt like I earned, I drove this oxidated, we called it the hoopty, and it was this oxidated uh, Plymouth Acclaim all through college and everything. It was a sweet so luggage ugly. rack though. The luggage rack it on that thing. did. Ooh. Oh man. It had a, a, it had a bumper in the front so you could tow it. And I peeled my calf skin off it so many times. So anyway, it was the ugliest car I've ever seen. It was super embarrassing. It had a hot pink sticker going across the back window for some reason that said cowgirl up. <laughs> Classy. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Avoid girls like that. <laughs> gentlemen. So, I felt like when I graduated from university, I got my first real teaching job that I deserved a new car. So I went into the Mustang car dealership, the Ford dealership, and I bought a brand new cherry red little Mustang. It's a Barbie car. The Barbie car. So that's what I drove. It was like fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars, which is funny. Steal now. Yeah, but at the time that was very expensive. It was brand new car and the payment was like 280 a month or something like that but it was a seven year loan i opted for the seven year to really spread out that debt because i thought that made it more affordable it really i didn't understand things like compound interest because nobody teaches that anymore Mm -hmm. in school i didn't know what that meant i thought uh it's a five percent i just was going to pay five percent of 15 i thought it was like simple interest you know so um for for anyone with kids or grandkids Jump on PragerU and look up simple com- simple versus compound interest. It's a five minute video and it is fantastic. It's all your kids need to watch to understand why they shouldn't spread their car loan out over seven years. I feel like it's the meat and potatoes of what it is that we should actually be teaching our kids. Because I think sure. there are a lot of adults, there are a lot of homeowners out there who don't understand the terms yeah. of their mortgage, which was me for a long yeah. period of time. You after like- we purchased our first home, I was like, hold on a second. <laughs> this is how this works? Years. Why yeah. is the principal not being paid down? I didn't understand it. For five years, you don't pay anything on the principal of a, I had no idea. a mortgage. And people don't understand that. I didn't know because nobody yeah. had ever taken the time to, to teach that to me. Four years in, well, we went when we went to refinance our house, you were like, wait a minute, why do we still owe what we bought yeah, it for? it made no sense. We've been didn't making $1,500 a month payments. Right. So make sure you're educated on <laughs> the, the terms of your mortgage when you sign that paperwork. Yeah. There's another really helpful website called um, One Minute Finances. And it's like every financial thing, they'll explain IRAs, uh, all different forms of interest, retirement accounts, all everything in 60 seconds. And there's a bunch of videos. Fantastic. Great resource. Yeah. So it's 
very important to understand what you're getting yourselves into. The banks don't really want you to know this information. So let's fast forward here a bit. Eventually we make our way back to Washington state where I, I get hired on as a brand new police officer making what I thought at the time was an a, a exorbitant amount of money, even though I was only making about $60,000 a year as a new officer. I remember getting that first paycheck for 1600 bucks, thinking that we had absolutely made it. Mm -hmm. And at the time, again, because we were maintaining this, uh, this goal and this philosophy of trying to squirrel away as much money as possible, we were sharing that Barbie car. The two of us, we had Nevea in her little uh, infant car seat that we would have to finagle into the back and get mounted properly. Mm -hmm. Total pain, not practical at all, no. but it worked really well for us uh, from a financial standpoint. Yeah, so we decided that the car payment was a little much for a very unpractical car and we still owed five years on the Mustang. So we ended up taking the car back. We had to pay $280, which was, I think it was like one payment for them to take it back and to be out of the loan free and clear. It was a couple. I mean, a few maybe two payments. So you ultimately you ended up taking a loss on that car, but it was yeah. good to, to cut with, ties with yep. that depreciating asset. Right. And then we instead bought a practical family vehicle for half the money. We bought a 1998 Ford Explorer. Um, gray in color. It was beautiful. Beautiful. But it was far more practical for us. It really suited our needs. And we paid 8100 bucks right. for it. It had 24,000 miles on it at the time. I knew that it was a vehicle that would be uh, reliable for us for many, many years to come. Mm -hmm. And the payment was going to be less than it was with your Mustang. Yeah, we got a five-year loan on that one. And we... I think we bought it, for, yeah, like you said, 8,500. 8,100. Instead still remember of the 16,000 dollars Mustang. Correct. So it was going to be half the amount of money. So we got into that car and we still decided to share one vehicle. Instead of buying two cheaper vehicles, we thought, nope, we will buy the one cheaper vehicle and now we've got extra money. So even though we were doing that, we weren't saving anything. And it was because our expenditures weren't being kept track of. So we sat down one evening and I think everybody should do this. Everyone, if you have debt, Sit down and write out your debt, biggest to smallest. Your And it doesn't even need to be debt, just your expenditures, your mm -hmm. monthly expenditures, our mortgage payment, our uh, utility bills, yeah, you home insurance, it. utility bills, your grocery budget, and set a budget and stick to it. Like really stick to it. Even if you're like there being crazy in the store with a list and scratching stuff off. Um, just anything, anything you're going to spend money on. And then I gave us for, at the time we were a family of four, I gave us a hundred dollar clothing budget per month. Okay. So let's dive into that part of it. How was it that we were able to keep our kids in decent looking clothes with spending a very limited amount of money on a month to month basis? Yeah, we had to get really creative with the clothing. So I identified a few um, really great secondhand stores. There was one called Kids Clothes and Battleground. I absolutely loved that store because she was really picky about what she took. It was important for me that even though we had this goal and we didn't really care what we looked like as far as what we wore and everything, we wore some interesting clothing. Still do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was important that the kids never felt that they weren't, you know, I didn't ever wanted them to be looked at or made fun of or anything like that because this was our goal and our dream. And so it was important that the kids looked nice and they felt confident. Yeah. Side note, I think it's still important to take a, a basic yeah. level of pride and how you present to other people. And even though our kids were homeschooled, yeah, we never wanted to make them feel as though they were lesser than in any way and, you know, run the risk of them being mocked by their peers. Right. Um, but again, when it came to Melissa and I, with me in particular, it just, we, we don't care. I, I really don't care. Yeah. So with kids, there are a lot of secondhand stores around. Almost every community has one. Um, Once Upon a Child is in a lot of locations. Those tend to be really big. And that's a consignment store. It's a consignment store. So you can go there. They've got Columbia fleeces and jackets and snow boots and all, you know, jeans. Everything's like around $5. You're never going to find those prices at the mall. Everything's in great condition. They don't take anything that is stained or ripped or anything like that. So everything looks nice. If you bought it at Old Navy and you brought it home and you washed it once, it's going to look exactly the same as just buying it gently used. And then after your kid wears it for a year and outgrows it, you can sign it back. Instead of taking cash, if you take credit, you get twice as much. Store credit. Correct. Yep. So I always just had this running account. Mm -hmm. And you're able to consign bedding, toys, just anything. So you're not just donating that stuff. You're able to turn it back into things that you can then, you know, spend budget. And like sometimes they even had diapers and stuff there. 
So this brings about the second point that I really want to emphasize is that it's not always necessarily, in, in our case, it really hasn't been whatsoever the case that um, you you save money based on your earnings, based on the amount of revenue that you're able to generate for yourselves, mm -hmm. for us collectively as a family. It has always been the point of emphasis that we are just going to be as mindful as we possibly can with our spending habits. Yeah. So sometimes I wouldn't, like, there were, Goodwill was my favorite place to go because Goodwill. Goodwill's big. And the trick is you find a Goodwill that is located by a mall because the mall donates the stuff that doesn't sell over to the Goodwill for a tax write-off. And now all of a sudden you've got all this shoes, clothing, jackets with tags on them from the mall. So I always find the ones by the mall and then shop their 50% off day. Don't go into Goodwill unless it's 50% off. Go on their 50% off day I would go out of there with garbage bags of clothes. I mean, like three and four garbage bags of clothes. And my total, would it'd be like $100. Yeah. And it was crazy. It would. I mean, we'd look forward to it every month. Yeah, I got, I would get really excited. We would wake up early. We would drive to the value village or to the Goodwill. And we would stand outside before they mm -hmm. even opened with the other people who were, who were trying to get there early to have their pick of the finest clothing yeah. that they had to offer. And it worked out great. And it was a prime example of how it is that we were able to live well beneath our means because we had the ability to go out there and splurge and afford nice brand new retail clothing for ourselves. But we didn't do it because for us, it just, it, it interfered with the ultimate goal of being debt free by 40 and being able to live the life that we wanted to live here in what ended up being Idaho. Well, the reality is that we couldn't really afford it. Like we had the credit cards to do it. We had the money coming in technically to do it, but not really because we had debt. So at the time when we bought the house in Vancouver and Nevaeh was a baby, we had uh, two student loans, a car payment, $2,800 on credit card, and then we had the mortgage. Correct. So if you have debt, if you have money that you owe to a third party and you do not have enough money in your savings account to just write a check and pay it all off, you are technically broke. I don't care if you're making $200,000 a year. If you can't pay off the boat, the Corvette, the bill from your last vacation, the timeshare payment for the year, if you can't pay those off with the money you have in savings, you're broke. Agreed. If you're broke, you can't afford to go buy new clothes. You can't afford to go on vacation. You can't really afford it. Can you do it? Can you finagle it? Can you put it on a credit card? Yes. And it's so easy to convince yourself because, uh, you know, oftentimes these are very indulgent purchases. It's easy to talk yourself into it and mm -hmm. be like, no, I, I either I deserve this or, yeah, I can make this happen mm -hmm. somehow. And I've, I've heard it said before, there's some kind of a, a very commonly used expression of that. If I can finance this, then I can afford it where I would yeah. kind of like you just said, I would completely disagree with that. Yeah, most people are making the minimum payments on their debts and not understanding what that compound interest is doing. And in the meantime, also racking up credit cards. So that's that can get you in a really dangerous situation really quickly. And I was definitely headed down that path until I started listening to Dave Ramsey. And he's really stern. And he's like, when he was like, kind of said that same thing, if you can't pay off your bills, which I couldn't, I looked at what we had in savings and I looked at what we had in debt. And I was, and he's like, you're broke. I was like, we're broke. Like <laughs> I never looked at us and thought we were broke, but we were. Yeah. We one hundred percent. Yeah, and we could have continued down that path for the next 30, 40 years. You working as a police officer, me being a stay-at-home mom, and then just buying things, going out to eat, going on vacations, and staying broke. So what you just mentioned there really was the genesis for us deciding that we wanted to be living this debt-free mm -hmm. life because it's never really made sense to me that it's uh, the the very common thing to do is to and again this is just one of those things where there's no real rational reasoning behind it it's just it's just what you do uh it never really made sense to me to basically sacrifice and forego the best years of your life working a miserable job that you really don't enjoy having to go do on a day-to-day -day basis for 40 plus hours a week to pay off these material possessions or even pay off your home over a period of 30 years and that's the reason that you end up having to stay being house broke in your job for as long as you do it's right. never added up to me, I get that we're all different, but for me and for us, never made sense. I don't think it really makes sense for anybody. No one wants to become a slave and work for the toys they don't even have time to use because- It's, it's self-imprisonment, it really yeah. is. So I did read a stat earlier that 50% of Americans do not have $1,000 in their bank account. So if a, something massive happens or their engine blows up on their car, they literally have to put it on a credit card. And we both know people that are like that. And yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it's amazing to me because it's just, it's such a stark 
contrast from the way that you and I have always done things over the last couple of decades. Yeah. So there was a really, we just decided to make it really, really simple. So we sat down, we wrote out all of our expenditures, and then we wrote down what we were bringing in a month. Then we deducted it. After we deducted it, this is no funny money at all. This is just the bare necessities. We had $900, 900 bucks left over. (laughs) Living large. So Dave Ramsey's suggestion was to put $1,000 into savings so that you weren't one of the 50% of Americans that didn't have $1,000 in a savings account. Put $1,000 into savings. And treat that like an expense to yourself. Well, no, it wasn't every month. It was just put $1,000 in savings. That's step one. Sure. But we eventually work our way toward we're doing this on a regular basis. Yeah, but that took years. Okay. So sorry, foreshadowing. You're you're you're, go, you're jumping fast ahead here. Fast okay. Forwarding. So you put your thousand dollars in that. That was pretty much the first month. Month two, it was time to get busy. So Whoa. then you're supposed to not in that way, and then you're supposed <laughs> to write out all of your loans that you have or your debts. So our smallest one was the credit card, twenty eight hundred dollars. Then we had the ten thousand dollar student loan. You know, I think then we had the car then the 10,000 student loan, then the 20,000 student loan. Those were the four debts we had. So you're supposed to attack the smallest one first. Reason being? Now, you were saying that it made more sense to attack the one with the highest interest rate first. Case could be made, but yeah, your your reasoning is that it it builds some momentum. It's a way of... uh, The snowball, he calls it. It's the snowball snowball. effect. And you're you're scratching these these debts off of your your list and you're, you're, you're easing that burden over time. And it's a sense of accomplishment. When yes. you knock a bill off and you no longer have to write that check every single month or deposit that money or see that automatic withdraw every month, when that goes away, you feel invigorated. Absolutely. And now you're like, all right, let's attack the next one. And then when you knock that one off, it's like, all right, let's attack the next one. So, And you're freeing money up for yourself in the process because now yeah. your expenditures aren't what they once were. Now, I didn't totally listen to Dave Ramsey because I didn't feel like $1,000 was enough for a family of four. When we really got into this, we had Kaimani. And I thought that it was important to have $5,000 in savings in case like something major happened. So we didn't actually start. I was just making all the minimum payments. And then I put $5,000 in savings. So I kind of, I messed up the plan and I'm sorry, Dave Ramsey. Um, So I put 5,000 and then after five months, we took that $900 and we threw it at the credit card. It took three months to pay off the credit card and then it was gone. We didn't have credit card debt anymore. And it was like, okay, now we only have three things. So then I started taking the $900 and putting it towards that $10,000 loan. That, it was nice to watch that $900 chip off but it was taking too long. So I decided to start a side hustle and that helped a lot. Correct. So in this journey, in this process, we uh, eventually figure out ways of just bringing in more money. Melissa right. did. And rather than just being a stay at home mom, you did a great job as far as, as jumping in and really thinking outside the box and figuring, hey, what it is, what is it that I can do to be bringing in some additional money? And so you came up with a number of side hustle projects, little, little home businesses that yeah. in the end ended up being massive for us. I decided that we weren't bringing in enough money. So the only solution was bring in more money. So I had to figure out a way because you couldn't really bring on more money without just working crazy overtime. To me, it wasn't worth the risk because of your job. I thought if I required you to work overtime and something were to happen to you, that would just be horrible in an overtime shift. And so that was like a weird place that my mind went. So I put the burden on myself to make money. I was thankfully artistic enough you're very artistic. I'm not, I'm not Leonardo da Vinci or anything like DiCaprio. that. DiCaprio. Oh, sorry. Wrong one. Yeah, that's the wrong Leonardo. But <laughs> so I'm not artistic in that way. I'm not going to go paint a wall mural or anything, but I was able to paint these themed nursery letters and plaques and potty stools. And I used to make like little timeout stools and stuff like that. Like funny little things for baby's own space, baby's own space. I think the Facebook page is still up. So back then there was no Facebook marketplace or anything like that. So I literally had like 40 email addresses and that way I could basically spam post on Craigslist and sit in the, the most pro, like the richest cities in the US. So I would look up like the top 40 income earning cities and then I would advertise my business in these cities because I thought these are the moms that are going to spend $100 on wooden nursery letters that are hand painted by somebody. And they did. <laughs> they, it was amazing. Yeah, they would email me and then I would ship it to them and it was great. So... I did that for quite a few years, but I started making like $500 a month. And then I started making up to like $1,500 a month. So now instead of $900, we had $2,400. And that didn't mean we had money to spend. That meant 
I had twenty four hundred dollars to throw at that that debt. Yes, and we were able to pay off that one loan relatively quickly. I mean, within a few months, we were able to get rid of that loan. Now all we had was the car payment and one more loan. So I just doubled down. We just kept doing it, and by the time we had Kira, we were what twenty seven. Yeah, we had. 20, no. 29. Yeah. So, okay. So 29. Okay. So we had no car payment, no student loan debt anymore, no credit card debt. All we had was a mortgage. Unfortunately, the market crashed. Okay. Before we even get to that part there. So we've, we've devised and figured out a way of spending a very limited amount of money on wardrobe mm-hmm. for the kids on basically we just, we, again, we were saving in any way that we possibly could. We were sharing a vehicle Mm -hmm. for a long period of time. That same 1998 Ford Explorer was our our only car, which meant that if I was going to work, you were left without a vehicle, which Mm -hmm. meant that sometimes, again, this is the sacrifice, the type of sacrifice that would have to be made was that you would walk to the grocery store while I was at work Mm -hmm. and you would come back with bags hanging off of a kid's stroller. You'd bring that back home. My dad gives me a call one day and says, hey, my in-laws are selling a older used pickup truck. It's a 1992 Mitsubishi Mighty Max pickup truck. It is a stick shift. It has 100,000 miles on it, but they only want 900 bucks for it. I looked it over and said, hey, 900 bucks is worth the gamble. So now we had a second car. But it, it the only reason that we had that second vehicle was because we were able to pay for it using cash and it was only right. $900. Yeah. And it, it just serves as such a good illustration, again, of, of eliminating that noise, of eliminating that outsider perspective, that perception and and their opinions and just doing what made the most sense for us because there were a lot of folks who laughed at me and the fact that I drove that thing, I needed to carry around a jug of oil with me because that truck burned so much oil. It squealed when it started sometimes, it but loud. it got me from point A to point B and it meant very uh, low car insurance payment and uh, no car payment period. So right. it was a great, great option. Yeah. So we had that car and then we didn't have any other debts now, but we still had. So every time that we paid off a debt, now we didn't have that minimum payment anymore. So it put more money towards. We get to roll that over yep. into our savings. Because so, I think at one point the student loan payments were like $300 a month. So once we got rid of the student loans, now we had an additional $300 to tack on to the 24 that we were making to then roll on to the mortgage. Okay, so, so that, what, you, what you had brought up is that we have found all these ways of saving ourselves money. We are now banking more money. We were paying down our debts. And in that process, in the middle of that process, we had made the purchase of our first home. What did that look like? So we bought a house in 07? Correct. And the market was kind of in a funny place, but a lot of people were like, inflation, inflation, it's only going to go up. It's a safe time to buy. And interest rates were really low. They were doing all of those wonderful Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac programs. Remember those? Where you'd go to the classes and then you would get the lower, no closing costs. Disastrous in the end. Ended up being a total disaster for the country. Uh, It worked out for us because we got in with no closing costs. We had to go to those little classes. Yep. Um, so we got like a Fannie Mae loan. Um, we were, I think, the only people in America that didn't default on them. And our house went underwater when the market collapsed in 08. 08. So we had only owned the house for about a year. And then all of a sudden, we bought it for $239,000, yep. which seemed like a lot of money at the time. It's crazy now. And then now. it fell all the way down to what, like 175 or something, 170? They were... St- People in the neighborhood started walking away. So that was kind of the recommendation. And it was sort of socially accepted to walk away from your mortgages at that time. That was the advice that we were given by mm-hmm. a few different people, including just the uh, real estate agent that we were working with at the time. And it, again, that was something that just made absolutely zero sense to me. And it uh, just from a morality standpoint for myself, <laughs> I was like, I'm not I'm not doing this. this. These are the terms to which I agreed. And I'm going to have to ride this out, which is what we ultimately ended up doing. Yeah, well, we know a lot of people that walked away and the so many people walked away in the neighborhood yeah. that the houses all became foreclosures and then they were selling at auction for 145 Ugh. 150 hindsight we should have picked up one of them when they were that price we couldn't afford it at the time no. it was so painful to see that yeah. happening around us because it made us feel like we, we were still owed 239 crazy. but it uh we we were we were steadfast in our in our thinking and you know a lot of a lot of praying that things would bounce back and that in the end we would be okay which well, was the case, but at the time, I remember feeling like, man, are, are we doing the right thing? It was one of the few times where I was questioning yeah. whether or not we were uh, we were we were off on things. 
Speaking of finances, a lot of us do our financial dealings online along with shopping and socializing, which makes me very thankful for the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. We rely on Surfshark to keep our online security safe when we are at home and while we're traveling. Yeah, if you don't know what a VPN is, it stands for Virtual Private Network. And trust me when I tell you, you want one. Surfshark VPN keeps your online security safe by encrypting all of the information you send from your devices to the internet. Essentially, it blurs it, like a mask, which protects your information from big companies and cyber criminals. Another awesome feature of having a VPN is it allows you to swap your real virtual location with a new one. So you can virtually travel to any country around the globe. This is particularly helpful with streaming services like Netflix, because different countries offer different titles. So if you have a streaming service, you can literally access thousands of different titles not available in the U.S. Something else Melissa and I really appreciate about Surfshark is their antivirus because it keeps all of our devices virus-free with real-time protection and scheduled scans. So if you do business, shopping, streaming, or socializing online, then you need a VPN to protect your private information, especially if you're using public Wi-Fi networks. We chose Surfshark because they're highly rated, they don't store any of our information, and they actually come with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Also, Surfshark's one of the only VPNs that allows you to use one account across all your devices. You can try Surfshark VPN by going to surfshark.deals slash NWOS and using our promo code NWOS to get 83% off plus three extra months for free. We want to thank Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this episode of the podcast. Now let's jump back into our conversation. Well, and then all of the real estate stuff that I used to, I would, when I did stay home and watch TV, it wasn't so Barbara's I was watching. I was always watching that financial guy. Remember him? He would kind of yell at the whiteboard and- Not Jim Cramer? Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. So he was a financial guy and he was always talking real estate and stocks and everything like that. And he was always saying, buy low, buy low, buy low. And I'm like, this is literally as low as it gets. How are we going to buy? We need to buy right now. And you were like, you're insane. Well, it wasn't right now. We knew we wanted to upgrade. That was our first home. We had zero intentions. Originally, when we purchased that home, it was like, hey, we're going to stay in this for two or three years. Hopefully it'll appreciate in value. And then we can come away with some equity that we can then roll over into a new home. When we figured out that, hey, we're actually tens of multiple tens of thousands of dollars upside down in this mortgage, we felt stuck. We didn't know how to navigate our way out of it. Well, so you and I, I remember, had different philosophies. You were like, we should stay in this house and then we should pick up one of these $150,000 ones, turn it into a rental because the rental market was really good because everyone had walked away from their mortgages. Nobody could get loans. Everyone had to rent for six or seven years to repair their credit. So it would be profitable. And so... The rental market was good. The rental market was, you know, you were it was able, insane. You were able time. to get fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars a month for these houses when the mortgage payments on them were nine hundred dollars. Right. So you were like, let's pick up another rental and stay in the little house. I do remember suggesting that. I was pregnant with baby number three, and I was thinking, no, I don't want to stay in the little house. Let's turn this house into a rental and let's buy something bigger that fits our needs that is going to appreciate significantly more that's a foreclosure or a short sale. So we started looking at all the short sales and foreclosures. We were on that foreclosure.com page and we found our house. So basically we used real estate to catapult us ultimately to being able to make the dream come true. So it wasn't it wasn't that clean and simple though. So, no. so touch upon how it is that we managed to restructure things in a way that was favorable to us, to where we were able to, I'll let you tell the story, but go, yeah. go ahead. So our mortgage payment was sixteen eighty a month, and we knew that we could probably rent it for fourteen fifty. So we needed to get the payment down. We originally got in at like a six percent interest rate. That was kind of the going rate. No seven, I think maybe it was five and a half. And then we bought it down at the time when the market collapsed. They lowered interest rates so significantly. It was like three something. It was three, three seven five. Point, three point. Well, I think it was. Yeah, it was something. It was in the threes. Three percent range. Yep. I think we ended up at three point five because we bought the rate down a little bit. There you go. So we refinanced at three point five. We got the payment down to thirteen fifty. We put it for rent for fifteen hundred. So now all of a sudden we're making one hundred and fifty dollars a month. And what that allowed for us to do was then take that short sale listing, Mm -hmm. uh, place an offer on that. Remember, we had to wait to hear back on that for six months. And we're like, come on. Oh, buying a short sale is a really hard process. And so we found that short sale. uh, We Things worked out there. We we end up with that house. And because it was a short sale, we had instant equity, which was a new feeling for us because we had Mm -hmm. never experienced that literally with our first house from the day that we purchased it. It had depreciated substantially in value. Yeah, we paid three thirty six for the battleground house. We paid three twenty three, and then I I just crazy. got done telling you yesterday that I got a uh, uh, email notification because I like I just like keeping tabs on these things that the current assessed value on that house is nine hundred and twenty thousand dollars in ten years. 
which is incredible. Triple, so had we still owned that house, we would have tripled our money, but that's a whole nother story. So now we have a profitable rental. And that means we don't have to walk away from that house. We were still $100,000 upside down in the house, but we knew if we just kept renting it, mm -hmm. it wasn't costing us anything. Nope. Eventually it would recover and it did. So for us, yes, we had paid off our loans. Yes, we had money coming in. Yes, I had the side hustle. And we had all these other creative ways that we were saving money and making money. But we had this big goal over here of being mortgage free. Debt free by 40 meant no mortgage either. Yep. So we needed to come up with ways of getting big lumps of money. And we chose real estate. Some people do Bitcoin, some people do stocks, but everything has risks involved. Real estate has risks too, but for us, we liked it because it was tangible. It's tangible asset. We could touch it. We could go out there. And, and even though it counted as debt against us, we never viewed it in that way. We viewed it as a tangible asset that was very likely to appreciate in value over time. Well, that's a positive debt when it's profitable. It's not a negative debt. Correct. So. You can't treat that or look right. at that in the same way. Yes, exactly. So if you have rental properties and you've got $100,000 mortgage payments on them, but you're renting them for more money than what the payment is, that's a profitable debt. So, which is weird. That's a, that's a weird just, thing that's to a think weird of. concept. I know, yeah, positive <laughs> debt. Um, so then the goal was moving to Idaho. Everyone's got a different goal. And I think a lot of people's goal is just to get out of debt, to just not have any loans besides their mortgage. That's kind of the ultimate, I think, American dream is just to have a mortgage, but not to have credit card debt, not to have car payments. And I that model that we did of just paying down the smallest one and and making sure that you're not spending more than you're bringing in and, and that amount that you have left over that you put towards your debt needs to be treated like a bill. You can't, you, like, you have to treat that like it's a bill. I have to put this money towards that. Yes, hold yourself accountable. Right. And then once you pay off all your debts, now take that money and put it in your savings account and start building up a savings account. Or reinvest it. Or reinvest it. But I think it's also important to, I would, I would go like 50-50 on that. I think you, it's important to have a, a good savings again, account. Again, let me say it again. We are not financial experts. Yeah, there I don't are people know. People out there would argue who know that. Far better than we do. Um, but yeah, you should either hold on to it and uh, have it there as an essay for yourself and or diversify and at least put maybe a portion of it into uh, some kind of an investment opportunity. Yeah. So our goal was a little different. We wanted to buy land. And I know it's not a lot of people's goal. So ours is different than what a lot of people's. But we wanted to buy land in Idaho cash you're still jumping ahead here so in the time Sorry. that we moved into that second home we we you, you continued with your side hustle mm -hmm. uh endeavors you created lazy locks which was a <laughs> child's headband yeah. uh, uh company business yeah. small at home business if you want to call it that um and then there were additional steps that, that allowed for us to take things even further with yeah. with you and again you still are not uh employed in this time we're still a quote unquote technically speaking a single income household you, you took on this side hustle business and then you also got into extreme couponing and couponing. <laughs> and I want to talk about this because <laughs> while it may sound silly, yeah. And if you're not familiar with extreme couponing, there was a show that existed a few years ago. I talked about that wasn't uh, totally realistic, but still there were these people who were going into uh, grocery stores and they were they were basically navigating this this fine line of finagling their way into doubling down on coupon mm -hmm. deals and sales and all that. And they were they were bringing home these massive heaps of uh merchandise or uh just uh toiletries what have you yeah for almost no money and so melissa dove into that did some research and really mastered this system that you came up with for yourself that yeah. that again it, it wasn't about how much money we were making it was about how much money we were spending yeah. and because you figured this out we were spending little to nothing on our grocery bill right so i figured out how to get free shampoo conditioner soap <laughs> hand wash, uh, a big thing, uh, travel stuff was really big. So I figured out if you, there were sites, there were literally Facebook pages. There's one called Couponing Safeway. Uh, Couponing Walmart is a Facebook page and it's a whole community. And people would be like, hey guys, Suave is on sale for two for $4. There's a dollar off two. And then Walmart's going to have a dollar off two coupon too. So you could stack the manufacturer coupon with the store coupon. Now it's free. Yeah, and this isn't widely known. No, and Safeway was even better. Safeway Albertson's company, they had doublers every Sunday where it was like they would double their store coupon. So if the Suave was two for four there and I had a dollar off two, then I would, you know, I would use a dollar off to manufacture. Then I would use a dollar off to store coupon. Then I would double it. Now it's free. So... <laughs> 
That, I'm, I'm giggling to myself because it was so goofy. The amount of pride and fun that you had <laughs> I'd be like, doing this. I would lay it out on the counter. I'd be look at my <laughs> my mountain of shampoo. And I loved it too. I would brag to the guys at work. I'd be like, you know what my wife just <laughs> did? My wife just have? called me. You know how much money she just spent on on like groceries for the week and toiletries like for the year? Four dollars. Well, there was this thing where um sometimes there wasn't a size limit on the coupon. So it'd be like some kind of hand lotion and it would be two dollars off a hand lotion coupon but then if you would go to the travel section they were 98 cents for the little lotions so i i would order the coupon i would figure out the deals for the week i would go after usually two deals when i started and then i became an expert i'd go after like five six deals and i would identify the freebies then I would go on to couponclippers.com. Yes, that's a thing. <laughs> I would order 50 like coupons and I would go in and I would clear the rack. So I would buy 50 travel size lotions with a $2 coupon, but they were only a dollar. Now I have a $50 surplus. Right. They can't pay you cash at the store. So instead I would grab $50 worth of groceries, milk, produce, meat, and I had this $50 credit and they would apply it to that. And the checkers thought it was so much fun. They called me coupon mom. They would flag me into their aisle because they wanted to see the deal I would get that week. And then we weren't, like, we didn't, weren't just hoarding it like a bunch of greedy jerks. No. Like we were donating a lot of this. We were taking it to a women's it. shelters. We were giving it away to our midwife to give out to women that needed it or yeah. babies that needed it. It's beautiful. Um, it's a beautiful way of going about things. Yeah, we were giving it to the crisis pregnancy center. I would um, go to for diapers and wipes and baby formula. Like I breastfed. Like I didn't have. I didn't need formula, but there was always crazy freebies on big things of formula. So I'd get forty cans of formula and I'd go give it to the crisis pregnancy centers mm -hmm. or to the women's shelter, and. So it was really nice to be able to help the community and also have a lot of fun. And yesterday we bought our first tube of toothpaste oh, and our first bottle I of conditioner. That. And they just told us when we got back from the store, they're also out of shampoo. It was like, I thought it was going to last forever because it's been, how it, long has it been it since we like had to purchase something like that? Our garage at one point, we had the big Costco racks. It looked like a Walgreens. It did. I mean, it would just be like, oh, and anytime my mom would come, I'd be like shop. Or, you know, like, I didn't care. I mean, there was one point when I had like 20 Sonicares and I was giving them to everyone. You want yeah. a Sonicare? <laughs> Sonicare. That was amazing. Yeah, it was, it was really fun and it was really profitable. And it was really, it was really beneficial again in our financial journey, like not to discount it at all. It's again, it sounds silly, but it made a massive difference for us. Yeah, you can get creative. Well, like, and then having a baby's expensive too. And then when we got pregnant with Eli, he was kind of unexpected and it was in the middle of this. <laughs> kind of, just kind yeah, of. <laughs> it was in the middle of this, like trying to get to Idaho, trying to pay off our mortgage. And it's like, surprise, you're having another baby. It's going to be medical bills and everything. So I decided to do a home birth one because I wanted to experience it. Too, because I found a really fun, quirky midwife that would let me pay her in coupon stockpile and and ammunition, ammunition. which you would get from which I work. I also got for free. You got it free from work because you're supposed to practice every month. You're supposed to practice shooting. I practice, every month. but yeah, over time, uh, you, you know, you you save your extra rounds, and it, yeah. it it adds up over time. So I paid for Eli's birth in uh, shampoo. And ammo. And it wasn't just your home birth. <laughs> there were other things. We we fully oh, we embraced all the time. bartering. Yeah. Bartering was, and actually still is, I mean, when given the opportunity, it, it, was, a, it was a big part of our life and a big part of our strategy. Yeah. And really when Eli was born is when I feel like we really took things mm -hmm. to an extreme in that same period of time where we were living. <laughs> we started, we were. <laughs> well, in that same period of time when we were living in that second house, we, there was, there was no we're out and about, let's grab ourselves a coffee. It was, no. hey, drip coffee all day, every day, because it's cheap. Mm -hmm. There was no, hey, while you're at work, why don't you go out with your buddies? I would go out and, you know, but I always, for my the entirety of my career, there were really only a handful of times, maybe 10 in total times, occurrences where I can remember purchasing my my lunch or my dinner while I was at work because you did a fantastic job of, of packing a lunch for me every day, mm -hmm. every day, because yeah. it was another means of saving ourselves a few bucks a couple right. of bucks on a day-to-day -day basis than a couple of bucks. No, I mean, i'm just saying it, it, yeah. you take a few dollars and you apply that toward every day it yeah. adds up over time uh coffee if i did go out to coffee with my buddies it was always the cheapest drip coffee yeah. that was available um but it still allowed for me to you know partake and socialize and do all that so um yeah family vacations how about that one 
family vacation. So I know a lot of people are thinking, you cheap bastards, you didn't do anything fun. Your kids correct. had a horrible childhood. You're 100% correct. No, so that's not true. So we just had to get creative with our fun. We went camping a lot. Our kids grew up going camping and they were just as excited to go camping as they were when we said we're going to Disneyland. Yeah. So, I mean, hot dogs over the fire, fishing, hiking, that is so fun to a kid. Like you don't have to take kids on lavish vacations in order for them to have a good childhood. Not at all. Our kids went on their first airplane last year yeah. and they were petrified. I remember. Yeah. So we, we did take a Disneyland vacation. We did. Um, not to be complete hypocrites about this, mm -hmm. but here's the way that that looked. Um, Melissa's cousin worked for Disney. Yeah. She worked and for was, Alani. And was given free passes on what, like a seasonal basis. Um, yeah. I think she was given free, like four free passes twice a year. Maybe. So she offered them to us. So I was like, okay, we have uh, free tickets to Disneyland. Maybe we should go. Uh, should we fly down there? No. No. We actually drove down in our horrible 1994 Toyota RV that we owned at the time. Um, I was seven and a half months pregnant and we drove a warrior like the little tiny old was it was it, great. it, was, it was, was it like a little 90s motorhome it was it was a 19 i think it was a 1994 and it Toyota overheated going up the pass and yeah. we had to keep pulling over to let it we cool. had a number of issues but that was cheaper than buying uh five airline tickets it at the had time no air conditioning no AC. driving through hey, we California. made it we made it there and back in and then so we were staying in the rv overnight along the way in like walmart parking lots because mm -hmm. again Free. And we'd and again, go into Walmart and get food to instead of going to a restaurant on the road. And then once we eventually ended up down in Orange County there, we were so sick. Melissa was super sick of staying in the RV with a fire. Well, I was us. literally sick. I was dr while driving in the RV thing. Goodness, there was a bathroom in the back. I because I was pregnant and I was getting so sick on that. I was vomiting in the back of the hot motorhome, but we were taking our kids to Disney. <laughs> Good times, and we were doing it on the cheap. But we eventually got down there, and we decided, no, you know what? We we need a a real bathroom and a real bed, and so we yeah we splurged. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we found a motel. We found a motel, and when I say motel, uh, this was like the most horrific two-story building like the kind of place you get murdered in overnight in and Anaheim. we ended up staying there with our family because it was like 25 dollars a night it was i think it was 46 dollars a night well, whatever but it, was. It, was it had a free shuttle to and from disney so that's what we uh splurged and opted for yep and so we stayed at this motel for 46 dollars a night and then leading up to disneyland because we knew that we were going to be going about six months before we had our family we told the grandparents that instead of buying the kids like Legos or something that they were just going to lose the pieces to for their birthdays and Christmas that year to give them Disney cards so that when we went to Disney, they would have their own spending money. So by the time we got to Disney, they all had like $200 in Disney gift cards and they bought their Minnie Mouses and they bought their big suckers the size of their face and they had so much fun and we kind of planned for that. So, I mean, we really did take things to an extreme. We got pretty weird and quirky. Extreme is... is a complete understatement. <laughs> this this is something that so financially this has worked out very favorably. But uh, along the way, there have been there have been family members, there have been discussions, there have been awkward situations with uh, friends, there mm -hmm. have been a uh, number of social events that we we've, we've had to say no to, and it. I mean, admit, admittedly, so it, it is it is served as a drawback for us from a social standpoint. But when you are hyper focused on a goal and you're right. trying to do something that that many people would consider to be uh, very difficult. You have to remain focused and you have to be willing to say no and and step on some toes every now and again, even if yeah. it's uncomfortable. Yeah, even if it's uncomfortable for yourself, even if there's sacrifice. If you want to do something different, then you have to be different. Correct. And and that was just, especially on a single, it was seemingly impossible to pay off all of your debts and then buy land and then put in a well and put in a road and and do all of that on a single income. I don't know that it's, I ever genuinely, genuinely believed that it was going to happen. I think I was hopeful that it was going to happen. I knew that I could put in the work toward trying to make it happen, but I didn't know that it would come to fruition. I really didn't. Well, once the real estate market recovered and it was doing really well, like in 2020, well, 2019, the market was doing really well. It was kind of before the whole back. COVID thing had hit and everything. Market was healthy. And we decided now's the time to really start making our moves in Idaho. So after we had paid off all of our debts, we were putting all of our extra money into our savings account. 
until we built up $150,000. And then it was like, okay, now it's time to shop for the property. We are not spending a dollar more than what we have in this account. Yes. And we spent all but $2,800. So we went from having $150,000 to having $2,800. And that was scary. But we had land. But we had our land. And that was worth a lot. And we had no land loan. And that was... But then it was time to get back home and get back to work because the next project was a road and a well. So it was like, okay, it's going to take us a year to save enough money to pay for the well and the road. And so we applied the same strategy. It was mm-hmm. like, hey, what's next? The road, okay, we have land. We need a road to be able to yeah. access it. What's that going to cost? Okay, let's replenish. Let's yep. get back to work. Let's get back to saving. Let's get back to working these side hustles to save as much money as we possibly can. And then one by one, we will check things off of the list, much right. much in the same way that we did in the beginning. We tried to pay off all of these loans. Yeah, so we would come up here in the summertime and we would stay for two and three weeks and just do some work. And we started putting in the garden fencing, things that we knew that we would need. Yeah, that's when we started documenting things on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. And exactly. So, and then I started selling vegetables out of the yard to try to make more money. I started, cause I grew a lot of produce in battleground. We grew a lot of produce. We produced a lot of eggs. We started doing meat rabbits. So then I started selling that stuff from the yard to try to make more money. And then it made sense to start a YouTube channel because In my brain, I wanted our CSA customers, the people that were coming and buying the vegetables to feel connected to their food because we live by Portland. That was very important to the people of Portland to feel like I watched this kale grow. So I'd be like, this is your kale seed and and I would plant it. And that was how these videos started. Um, YouTube wasn't a side hustle. The gardening and the meat rabbits were a side hustle, but somehow YouTube became a side hustle that ultimately ended up being... The answer. Our, our career. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which was totally, totally by mis- by accident. I say so, we're so accidental YouTubers. Big swings. And like I said before, you know, with emphasizing these side hustles and how so oftentimes they seem silly. I mean, yeah. when, you, when you introduced lazy locks or uh, yeah, I was like, I'm going to make headbands. You're like, yeah, what? baby's own space. I think I scoffed both times. I was like, this is ridiculous. I do the same thing with YouTube and you never know where life is going to take you. You never know what, uh, what, what plans God has in store right. for you, but things take on a life of their own. And when you're, when you're swinging big, yeah, sometimes you're going to miss, but every now and again, mm-hmm. uh, the unexpected might happen and, uh, things will, will flourish and become something that you, you never anticipated and a, a tremendous blessing. And I think another important thing is when you are picking a side hustle, if you are picking a side hustle, pick something that you love and that you're passionate about. If you're good at art, make it art. If you're good at photography, make it photography. If you're good at finances and stuff, become, you know, do a, be a bookkeeper Mm part-time for somebody or get a real, I got a real estate license. It's another one of your many side hustles. Yeah. I got a real estate license because I knew that we were going to be buying and selling rentals or that we were going to be buying that house. And for me, I could get a real estate license in about 30 days of studying. And I was going to save us 3% on the purchase of a home, 3% on selling a home because I got to be the real estate agent. Yep. And that was worth that 30 days of just going and getting that license. Yeah. Even and then if, as a bonus, you, you just through random happenstance, mm-hmm. you, you managed to get a couple of deals done. And that yeah. was just some couple additional friends bonus cash. were like, hey, you have a real estate license. Do you want to list our house? And I'd give them one or 2% off. And you earned a, a commission. And yep. that went straight into our savings toward trying to get stuff done here in Idaho. Yeah. So I would say like pick something that you're good at or at least something that you love because you never know where your side hustle is going to go. And your side hustle could end up eventually becoming what it is <laughs> the you primary do, primary hustle, <laughs> which is what what happened for us. So we did end up becoming debt free by thirty seven. We sold the rental, and with the money from the rental, the rental did recover. That's the yay, it did, yeah. So so after many years of having it being a profitable rental mm-hmm. and making us money, we we sold it. We had equity at the time, and we we had seventy four thousand dollars, yeah, which was huge for us. You know, another yeah. lump sum of uh, cash to be used to uh, pursue this dream. Yep. So we took the $74,000. We bought a truck, a used truck, germ- the truck that you drive Sorry, now. Sorry, little Blackie. Yeah. We sold little <laughs> no Blackie. No more 1992 Mitsubishi Mighty Max. Yeah. We sold him off. He was great. We loved him. And the kids were literally like almost cried watching him drive away, but he went to a, a nice home. So <laughs> he's like the Debbie. <laughs> um, so then we brought on um, a bigger used truck that would pull a trailer mm-hmm. and pull a like an enclosed trailer so we can actually move and then the same one we have now. and then our RV. So we took the $74,000, we bought the truck cash, we bought the RV and we paid off the well. Mm-hmm. So now we have water, we have the RV to stay in. 
and we had the foundation for the house. Yep. We paid for the foundation septic for the house um, and the shop. We paid for the shop. And, yeah, cash too. The shop yeah. So when, by the time we moved to Idaho, we had paid off the land, the water, the shop. We had the RV to live in. We had the truck to pull the RV and we had a road and we were like, okay, we're ready to go. So we knew that we had about $350,000 in equity in that short sale that we had bought. At the point in time in 2020, our home had doubled in value in the seven, eight years that we owned it. Yep. It's since doubled again, <laughs> but oh, it's, it's tripled from the time well, we bought tripled, it. Yeah. Still, yeah. So um, we sold that and we had all of those things paid for. We walked with $350,000 the day that we showed up in Idaho. That's what we had to build the house with. It took one night of the water bursting and breaking all over our very first night here it was freezing temperatures and <laughs> the pipes broke in the trailer good times kenji was sleeping on the floor um snoring and the kids were all over the place it took one night of us saying we need to build the tiny home so that kind of shifted plans a little bit but that's we, where we the spent, journey we spent here began. eighteen thousand dollars here um on this it's not a structure on this uh this living space here at the back of our shop and with doing that and with doing things ourselves, that was another point of emphasis in our strategy for saving money. If there was anything that we could take control of and get accomplished on our own, whether it be building our own home, building this, um, giving the boys haircuts. Yeah. For me to get a haircut, for the boys to get a haircut, you know, every couple of weeks, every mm -hmm. two to three weeks is- Haircuts are big, yeah. It's a costly expense. So to use that as an example, anything literally that we could find um, in, in our to-do list that we could yeah. take on and tackle ourselves, accomplish and get completed ourselves, we did no matter how big or small and the stuff that we gave up may not be the stuff that other people want to give up like maybe going out on friday night for pizza with your family is a non-negotiable maybe that is something put it in your expenditures then budget it in yep it can't just be a surprise thing but then really get real i think the stuff that you really have to think about is coffees if you are broke and you're broke if you can't pay off if these are your debts and you don't have enough money you're broke it's okay <laughs> <laughs> like, you heard okay. you're broke. We all been there. You broke. Stop spending your money. Stop buying coffees. Like stop doing that. Stop going out to eat at work. We used to call it micro spending. Micro spending. Yeah. It's little things. It's seven dollars here. It's nine dollars for teriyaki. You can take nine dollars. You can buy turkey meat, cheese. Lucerne's on sale right now at Safeway. Ninety eight cents a pack. <laughs> Just That's a yesterday. week's worth of cheese. They always have sandwich meat half off. You can buy that the ten dollar pack for five bucks. You get a loaf of bread. You get. And you make yourself a beautiful turkey sandwich, lettuce, big slabs of tomato, All the fixings. onions. I mean, you get a beautiful turkey sandwich. You can literally make yourself that every single day for the same price as going out to teriyaki one day. Yeah, it, like, it all adds up. It, yeah. it all adds up, which is why I always try to preach like, hey, it's not always about what it is that you're earning. You could be making minimum wage, but you can always do more to save more. And in the end, you will be better off yeah. for it. Just, and it's... It's no. a huge relief. It's such, it's such, there's so much freedom to come right. along with not constantly feeling the weight of the burden. That is a massive number on a screen or on a piece of paper, yeah. knowing that that's your responsibility. You are solely responsible for making sure that that gets paid down to zero. Yeah. But I highly recommend like looking into, I know Dave Ramsey, like a lot of times people are like, oh, cliche, listen to him. It's common. It's a very to common his sense snowball approach. thing. Like write out your expenditures, write out what you got see what you have at the end of the month and start throwing it towards, put that thousand dollars in, you need to have that thousand dollars. That puts you in the top 50%. Then start paying off the smallest loan. It feels so good to be like, that debt is gone. It and does. then the next one, that debt is gone. Like you start, you become invigorated. You become addicted to saving instead of addicted to spending. And when it's all gone, you feel, like I said, again, you feel free. And yeah. it, it's it's the reason that since accomplishing this goal for ourselves, we we have opened up a, a whole new world of possibilities yeah. to where we can start taking these family vacations. We just mm -hmm. went to Hawaii and not having to feel guilty about it, not feeling as though it's a it's a step in the wrong direction. Um, you know, if there's if there's a new car, I'm still driving a 10 year old vehicle. I've never owned. You can say that I've owned the van. The van is the only va the vehicle that we have ever purchased brand new. It's because we got a steal of a deal on it. It was during a, a sale. There was zero percent uh, financing. It made sense. We needed a very practical family vehicle. I'm still driving a 10 year old truck. The, the truck that I had previously was was a 20 year old truck. Um, and it's, it's, it's all worthwhile. They're very small sacrifices that over time, because you make it a habit, you don't, you have a tendency to not view at all 
as a sacrifice. I never felt yeah. as though I was giving anything up. And it, it feels great now knowing that we have all of these options open and that we've, we've made them available to ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, it's great. It's invigorating and it's addicting. And the next thing you know, you're paying for your home burst with ammunition and life gets weird and that's fun. Yeah. Good times. And so it's been a long journey, a lot of discipline. Um, but, but again, we're, we're dodo birds is a very common sense approach. I cannot hammer home enough that we are not financial experts. So take all of this with a grain of salt. It's just what's worked for us over time. It does require some sacrifice, like we said, but yeah. it's, it's so worth it in the end. And to, to, again, just, I, it feels so freeing. Yeah. And you do need to go out and have fun. Like that's really important, yeah. but not all the time. You're not entitled to go out and have fun all the time, but Burn it. we went to restaurants a few times a year for birthdays. Birthdays were like going, we would go to a restaurant, Special occasions. anniversary, things like that. Like if we were going to a restaurant, it was often three, four months between going out to eat. Road trips, yep. um, camping. Road things. trips are huge. We went, we took the kids on a 10 day long road trip to Yellowstone and we stayed at the cheapest hotels along the way. And it didn't matter. It was the best vacation. It was a great time. And we didn't spend a lot of money doing it. I think the entire trip mm -hmm. was like 2,500 bucks if I yeah. remember. Yeah. Which is a lot cheaper than a 10 day vacation anywhere else. So just little things like that to pay attention to, but don't sacrifice on family time. You don't need to spend a lot of money to give your children an amazing childhood and great memories. Like they just want you to be present and be there and take them camping. And that's just as fun. Amen. Yeah. So, All right, mama. We're dodo right. birds, but we did it. How about that? Yeah. 40. <laughs> 40. Debt free. Um, we want to thank you guys so much for being here, watching, listening. If you have any comments or suggestions for ourselves, for other people when it comes to uh, this topic, please stick them down in the comment section down below. Um, and anything else from you, Mama? I don't think so. All right. Good times. We so appreciate all of you being here. We'll see you next week here on New World Old Soul and then new Good Simple Living video coming out on Saturday. All right. All right. All right. We'll see you guys.